Humanity, whether we like to think it or not, collectively knows to stay out of the water. Whether you are me with a primal fear because of that time something huge ran into your legs in murky ocean water, when you were a youngling and still to this day, even if tiny fish attack your legs, you become Jesus and walk on water, or you're just uncomfortable by the fact that when you look out in the vast ocean when you're on a boat, it makes you feel small and insignificant. The reality is most people have a desire to explore the world, but not the ocean. And why is that? Well, because the ocean is obviously a horrible place. Deep within the peaks and valleys located miles underneath the water, horrific animals exist and eat each other all day, every day, feeling in the darkness and then dragging things to their doom in the pitch black. What was the figure I read one time? Like every 15 minutes a sperm whale is actively engaged in battle with a colossal squid? Yeah, no thanks. But as humanity has probed the depths, or at least some of us have, who are like absolutely psychotic or worse, a marine biologist, we have begun to find strange creatures we only assumed were legends. Humanity has long told stories of creatures out in the open ocean. Monsters that would attack and sink ships regularly where man was forced to engage in battle with an unknown beast. The one that regularly comes to mind is going to be the Kraken. What's interesting about the Kraken is we assumed it to just be complete nonsense, or at least it was complete nonsense by those on land, but people who actually went out there would come back with damage to their ships, occasionally speaking of giant tentacles that wrapped around their vessel. We know now, this is actually real. As made mention already, the colossal squid was known to attack human vessels and still does. We just have bigger ships. If you were in the wrong place at the wrong time, and if your boat was small enough, it's highly likely that you were never heard from again. But this segues perfectly into today's episode, actually. In the events of Deep Rising, and the movie is called Deep Rising, I've had a bunch of people ask, like, well, what's your movie called? Like, I always mention it by name in the intro. A cruise ship would be besieged by a creature that is absolutely massive. A team of mercenaries would be forced to contend with the issue as it conflicted with their mission there. So in today's episode, let's discuss how this actually isn't that too far-fetched of an idea, how this creature operates so intelligently, and what is the neurology behind its ability to do so. But first, this episode is sponsored by Factor. Are you ready to have over 35 different options concerning your meals and 55 nutrition-packed add-ons bolstering your meat suit that is not only never frozen and is also delicious, but is super easy to reheat and eat? If you are, then look no further than today's sponsor. Factor is a meal delivery service that I've used for about two years now, and personally, I think it's amazing. Picking the meals you want, like keto, calorie smart, vegan, or veggie, or if you're me, then the Protein Plus option is pretty much what I go with. Factor is a fantastic way to kind of help you stay healthy and in a tasty way. Not only that, but it, let's be real here. People like to go out and eat a lot because it's kind of the convenience of it, but with Factor, it's actually less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved and actually she has you know, like the nutrients your body needs. I personally have been able to smash health goal after health goal by getting my diet in order, which has been incredibly helpful as of late. These meals keep my fridge well stocked and basically they are my dinners every night. So if you're ready to reach your own personal goals or maybe just start eating a little healthier, then by heading to factor75.com or clicking the link in the description and using code Roanoke50, you can get 50% off your first factor box and free wellness shots for life. Two free wellness shots from three available flavors for every order while you are an active subscriber. All right, let's get back to it. We kick off our story deep below the South China Sea. As we all know, this area of the planet has exceptionally deep trenches that could swallow Mount Everest like it was nothing. Just like your mom. And as we all know, there is something contained within. An unspeakable horror, if you will. Like that one guy who said the anglerfish stick was getting annoying. This isn't a shtick. This is real life. I've just never had an outlet where I could actually espouse my disdain for those things. Oh, and there's like a giant monster down there or something. Moving on. So at this point in the 90s, James Cameron hadn't made his maiden voyage and thankfully not the Ocean Gate vehicle to the bottom of the trench. So we actually got to see what was down there because he did that. It's dark and there's a lot of creepy animals. Thanks for watching. And in these waters, vehicles tend to vanish without a trace, never to be seen again, which is also true. The ocean be a harsh mistress. Which, considering all the people that go missing, you also have to ask yourself, what is your acceptable ratio of decomposing meat suits to water molecules that you find acceptable to swim in? As something swims in the depths, we can hear it growling and screeching. I can, you can't, because there's no sound on this. This is my literal nightmare. Why did someone request that I watch this? I am never listening to you guys again. We then see a small dinghy making its way through apparently stormy conditions, but the water is like glass. Alright, then seems pretty legit. As a stagehand sprays a windshield with a hose, we see my ideal girlfriend on the outside of the boat with the captain inside. Losing a game of solitaire, I didn't even know that was possible. I've just never been bored enough to play. He then smacks the radar and yells down to his mechanic Joey. As Leela comes in, 
Team leader comes up from the bottom of the ship asking if they are on schedule. The captain remarks how they're in the middle of nowhere, heading to the middle of nowhere. Already, the teams do not like one another because mercenaries have no personality traits apart from being a tough guy, testosterone, and the crewmates who are already on the boat are just normal people. Also, I'm legally obligated to say that was a joke about the mercenaries because I don't want them coming after me. Although, let's be real here, I'm not important enough for that. So continuing their trek across calm waters in a massive storm because for some reason no wind has been kicked up in the process, we move over to a dated cruise liner. At the time though, it was probably pretty lit. But have you seen the icon of the seas that like Royal Caribbean has? Like good lord man, let's just create a floating continent already. Inside everyone is pretty jazzed which uh, ooh this must be a fancy cruise line. See I stick to the booze cruises with Colombian women in lawn chairs. Experience shows that's the way to go. As the party continues, the creator of the Argonautica gives a speech about how this is the largest and best cruise ship and how I dress better, look more handsome, pull more than you ever could. Oh, and then something about like people's dreams coming true on a cruise ship. If dreams involve intestinal bacteria running rampant and loose women, then boy do I have a dream for you. One woman, Trillian, in red, begins making her way through running into the captain before pickpocketing him and stealing his key card. Her whole plan is to break in lockboxes in the secure area. But while she's outside, she hears screeching in the distance, which I'm not sure if you've ever been on a cruise, but I'm sorry, you cannot see more than a few dozen feet off the ship. It is literally pitch black out there. And if you let it get into your head too much, you'll freak yourself out. Back on the dinghy, Team Testosterone are talking. So you have Mr. Obsesses Over Women, Mr. Swolger, Mr. Slickback Hair, Guy from Australia, and Irishman. The gang's all here. So Australian then pulls a force multiplier on like Lady Killer here, and yeah, that seems like a measured response. And then they get the Aussie to puke up his food as he's seasick on completely flat water. He's got an iron stomach over here. Sneaking past Team International, Joey goes to check on the cargo. Opening up one of the containers, he finds a torpedo. Nothing like being involved in activities that are supposed to incite terror, am I right? I'd say what it actually is, like what it's really called, but monetization would be nuked from orbit on this video. So as he reaches out for the torpedo, it emerges beeping, which is probably a good sign, and then gets grabbed by Mr. Swole, who's also known as Vivo, but we don't use names around here. He's then thrown to the rest of the team. Getting stomped and like almost immediately knocked out, the captain goes down to help him. And I'll tell you what though, Joey could take a whooping. No glass bones or paper skin here. The captain shows up with a harpoon and a standoff ensues, but luckily it diffuses because if you take out the captain, you're gonna have a tough time finding out where to go exactly. But back over at the cruise ship, Mystery Woman breaks into the security office and almost immediately gets caught. Great plan. And as she is then thrown into the freezer where she would surely freeze, uh, like we'll find out later, this would 100% be attempted murder or at least like criminal negligence or something, and it'll all make sense soon. So Joey gets patched up, telling them about the cargo as the squad gets loaded up. Apparently you have force multipliers with a thousand round capacity. Bro, the laws of physics would like a word with you on how you're storing 1,000 rounds inside of that thing. Like, let's be honest here. I'm just gonna go ahead and assume this is a 5.56 round because um, I make a lot of assumptions here, which is 12.31 grams. You have 1,000 rounds of that, which is going to put that at about 27 pounds. Um, at like uh, 27.13 pounds, I believe. And then on top of that, let's say it was just a standard weight of an AR-15. That's gonna be about 6.55 pounds. Putting that thing at 33.68 pounds, which is pretty heavy to be honest with you for your standard force multiplier to carry a thousand rounds. Anyways, that just seems like a really bad idea, but hey, that's just me talking here. Anyways, it really doesn't matter because Conceptually, it makes no sense how you would store that much ammo inside of that thing. But let's be honest here, this was really so that they didn't have to teach anybody how to reload, or they didn't have to show them carrying extra ammo. So as that's happening though, a man approaches the ship's brain, essentially takes out the AOL discs, and then uploads his own discs, which then corrupts the computers entirely, destroying the navigation and communication ability. Sort of like that one time I tried to download Linkin Park's num.exe, and it turned out to just totally nuke the family computer. But ah yes, very good for the hundreds of passengers on board. This is what makes the ship completely dead in the water, which would be bad in a storm with actual waves, but luckily there are no waves. So as they discuss what they're going to do, one of the men calls out saying something is directly beneath them and rising fast. From the deep, deep rising perhaps. Anyways, hitting the ship, everyone then starts falling over the safety railing, not very safe at all. That really did a lot to prevent any of that, as everyone starts running somewhere. Mystery woman then gets knocked out by a box of cabbages as panic ensues. One woman then runs to the bathroom and hears something all around her as the metal begins buckling as then she's grabbed and pulled through the toilet. Not a great way to go. 
As the dinghy continues to approach, Team International attaches a torpedo launcher to the front. As the sonar pings, the captain then spots something. Looking out, well, it's a random speedboat. They then run into it, completely frying their engines and ripping the hull apart. While that crap's going on, Lilo then spots a cruise ship in the distance. Taking the binoculars after trying to make another move because Joey knows what's up, he zooms in and sees it more clearly. It looks totally fine, but we will uh, come to find out it's not actually fine. Upon that being said, the team look at one another because that's apparently what they are doing out there in the first place. So the team then turns on the crewmen, of course, as they take over and head towards the cruise ship. It's mutiny. Guess the philosophy of if the money is there, we don't care is probably not the best way to live your life. So as they discuss why it's not moving, they head in with Finnegan and Joey as the rest of the team is also with them, leaving behind Layla and Billy to man the dinghy. Ascending to the side, they come through in the sponsored by c section. Moving through, absolutely nobody is to be found. They assume everyone is in the atrium of the ship, which I mean, what are the odds of like every single passenger being in the atrium? Nobody was headed back to their room. Nobody met up with a woman and was going to a quieter part of the ship. Nobody was falling out after eating the buffet, absolutely obtaining beach body status through the aforementioned intestinal bacteria and had to sprint to the bathroom. Highly doubtful. So as they continue walking through, it is painfully obvious and becoming clear that uh, really nobody's here, which might be a little unnerving. Finding some blood but no bodies disconcerns the group. As an elevator comes up, all they find is more blood. Continuing to search for anyone, all the lifeboats are there as well, basically indicating that nobody got off the ship. Moving through, they continue sweeping the area, but it looks like post-evac. They're there to hit the vault, so why not just get your stuff and leave? And at that moment, all professionalism ceases as some fireworks go off in the distance, which is probably great for like a ship to have inside, as they open fire with their alleged 1,000 round force multiplier. Bro, I cannot get over that. Where would it be stored? Also, you may be wondering uh, where this creature is at this point. Yes, I agree. It took forever to spot this thing. So finally, Sleeping Beauty wakes up after hearing the pipes above start moving. Somehow knowing which wire to cut, it's always the green one by the way, she's able to escape. As the group then heads up to the captain's nest, all the windows are broken and nothing works. Meanwhile, Layla is plasma torching the broken metal, but here's something in the water. As she yells up to the guy to turn on the pump so they don't sink, oh lord, here comes Mr. Bloaty coming to hang out with her. Also, what is she even doing right now? With that plasma torch, I mean, like, it doesn't appear to be doing much of anything if she's trying to cut it, probably because seawater keeps cooling it off. Looking at the body, she's distracted as she's then grabbed and pulled through the hole in the ship which is pretty tragic. Meanwhile, down in the machine shop, Joey remarks as something smells bad and then gets slapped for it. As Aussie extraordinaire goes to look around, he sees something in the pipes move. The Aussie continues looking, but hearing nothing and seeing nothing, he decides to just drink some seawater, which is great for his kidneys, as then he threatens whatever is out there and then starts freaking out before spotting something in the water. It ends up grabbing him and spraying him all over the area. T-Ray is no more. I guess you could say he was pulled down under. <laughs> So Lady Killer starts freaking out, accusing them, which, I mean, that's just an absolute buffoon move. While that's going on, Trillian over here gets caught for a second time trying to break into the secure lounge. She's not really a good thief, is she? They then ask her where the other passengers are, but she has no idea. As Mr. Swolger's status opens the door, going money, 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 like Mr. Krabs or something, he catches an axe to the dome as the other three are then taken out. Whoops, but everyone's cut of the take just got bigger by his elimination. So then Lady Killer gets dragged off to his doom like a total idiot, throwing his force multiplier up into the air to the others as he gets turned into a nice blood mist. Finnegan then opens up as they try to tell Team Leader that they need to get out of there. Looking back, they realize the creature is coming straight for them as they open up on it again. Trillian gets into the elevator as she heads in the complete wrong direction for some reason as something is outside of the elevator. Hearing screeching, she attacks Joey as the door opens as Finnegan then grabs her and they get back in and head up. Reuniting with the Expendables, they are all freaked out as the guy who created the ship yells at Team Leader, indicating that he knows him. They keep trying to tell, like the away team, that the ship's infested, but for some reason, no matter how many times it's said, like the mercenaries just cannot grasp the concept. They just keep blaming everybody else. So the elevator is now dropped by the creature as they head down, way down, all the way down. If you got that reference, uh, it was an obscure one. Good on you. So then they burst out of the elevator and find a nice hallway of blood. How wonderful. That and a ton of desiccated skeletons. And for the fourth time, Finnegan tries to grab a force multiplier but gets stopped. That is, just before the hallway at like the end starts deforming, and it's kind of becoming an all-hands-on-deck sort of scenario. Nothing unites man, quite like the fear of everyone's collective in. It's our sort of thing, like, 
It is what it is. So as they stay quiet, the warping of the metal stops. But stepping on Amidi's skull, they all yell as the creature begins trying to break into the hallway once more. Back on the dinghy, Billy heads downstairs to try his luck with Layla. Sorry, bro. She's just a meaty skeleton by now. I'm just as sad as you are. He calls out to her, but she doesn't respond. Moving into the engine room, back on the cruise ship, though, Simon talks about what happened. Mr. Finnegan figures it out, like, almost immediately that Simon is the man who made the ship inoperable. Simon did it for the insurance money, so they have a nice fight over misjudging the market. I mean, I've been there, honestly. Then they bring up a valid point when they question Simon about the passengers and how they were all screwed, and he says, I'm not a savage. They would have been safe and evacuated in the lifeboats. Except for Trillian, who you locked in the freezer, right? Again, it was his plan, and she was definitely going to meet her end in the chaos, because nobody would have checked the freezer, and then they would have blown this thing up. So Finnegan starts flirting with Trillian, as one does. As Joey sits there, something begins leaking on him, and good lord, the giant tentacle comes out of nowhere. Seeing a handprint in it, the tentacle then starts dropping digestive fluid as it takes some rounds, and then someone is released. It's our old pal Billy, who's like half digested. Someone might want to put him out of his misery with that one. His Broca's area is definitely destroyed, as you can see his brain, and he can't speak. Although, I don't think my brain would really be operating and producing words in any capacity if I look like that. But as they open up on the tentacle, nobody decides to help Billy, and they just kind of all run away. Like, it just, just one round. Probably would have helped the dude. So first things first, finally we actually see a part of this creature. I know this movie took forever to actually show us. Uh, it was the 90s, and there was a lot of filler. So let's begin with the actual name. First and foremost, this creature is affectionately known as Octolus. Oct meaning eight. You might be tempted to think that this is a squid of sorts, but squids have eight arms and two tentacles. The largest squids, the colossal squid, is around 60 feet, whereas the largest octopus is around 16 feet. So to understand Octolus, we need to understand some behavioral patterns which delineates the species. Squids are constantly traveling. Essentially, they migrate continuously until they drop or are eaten by a sperm whale. They can also travel in schools and prefer the company of one another. Octopus, which actually, believe it or not, everybody always says octopi. Uh, that is not correct. And octopuses is, is not correct either. Octopus is the plural form. It's sort of like a moose and then moose, right? That's how you make it plural. But they are solitary creatures for the most part. They will pick one area to live in and will continue to exist there on a more permanent basis. Along with this, they will sometimes choose dens in which to reside in. Given what we will see in this specific area and like how many ships have gone down, this would imply that this is most definitely an octopus over a squid given its propensity to stay in one location and have hunting grounds specifically. So with this, we can now assume a few things about this creature. First, it likely only has eight arms, so to speak. However, much like other octopus, not only is this creature itself highly intelligent, which means if man ever goes missing, the next creature to replace us is definitely an octopus, but the arms themselves can operate with semi-independence. Which, when we see more examples of how the arms seek and consume, we will get into the neurology of that when we get to that point. So Finnegan then runs back to Trillian, as they are now trauma-bonded, guaranteed to last a few weeks. But after that flames out, uh, <laughs> it kind of goes just as bad as it started. Finnegan then makes a trade. He's like, you'll give me anything I want. And she's like, yes, I guess. And uh, he's like, well, how about a cold beer? There you go. Subvert their expectations. As then a tentacle emerges to just straight up C-block him. Which, uh, if you've been online, standard tentacle action. Finnegan then grabs a force multiplier as the tentacle opens up. But Trillian saves him before he gets totally got. Also, nobody is regaining normal hearing after this excursion. Just lots of e for the rest of your life. Ask me how I know. I, I didn't, like, you know, open up in a cruise ship or anything. Uh, I just work construction. So at this point, the captain of the cruise liner gets grabbed and pulled down to his doom with the tentacle eating him. They then fire on it, but obviously, I doubt they hit anything. They don't really seem to be the best mercenaries in existence. It is at this point that Simon seems to know what these things are. An offshoot of the Atoa Arkei family. As the water gets deeper and colder, they appear to get larger. They hidden burrows and they crush their prey in their jaws and then drink them. Well, crabs anyhow, because as we all know, we eventually return to crab. So let's talk about that for a moment. Now, given what Simon has seen up until this point, and the assumption that the ship is infested with them, he would be correct in his assumption. However, as we all know, the creature's name is Octolus, which carries a certain amount of weight. The Atoa, I believe it's pronounced Atoa, is a worm that is known from the Cambrian fossils. These creatures existed basically back 508 million years ago, and they were said to go extinct about 505 million years ago, which 3 million years ago 
or three million year time span. Doesn't sound like that much, but that's actually a long time for species to be alive. I wonder if humans will last that long. And they were a type of worm that had thorny mouth parts that were used to grab onto prey and then crush them as they were then sucked dry. These creatures would live their lives in burrows and had no backbones. Behaving as ambush predators, they would wait until something happened by, snatch it up, and drag it down, holding on to it to be consumed. The spikes that it had on its head, numbering roughly 40 to 50, it would hold on to struggling prey and would also anchor it in the ground at the same time. But the thing is, they were only about 15 centimeters in length or 5.9 inches in the Lord's units. So not very large, but 5.9 inches is actually above average. <laughs> Which this is where the concept of deep sea gigantism comes into play. Deep sea gigantism is a horrifying adaptation to the crushing pressures and frigid waters of the deep ocean. Known as Bergman's rule, this states that sea animals tend to increase in body size with a decrease in temperature. And this is because the larger the creature, the more it is able to retain heat within its body, so it would be advantageous to grow to large sizes in order to survive. Along with this, believe it or not, waters of the deep sea are also relatively oxygen rich in comparison to the warmer waters closer to the surface. And this allows for creatures to grow as their bodies are more easily saturated with the required oxygen. And coupled with this, there is another concept that kind of goes hand in hand. You can think of the deep sea as sort of like an island. Away from the pressures and biodiversity of warmer waters, well, pressures in the sense of like pressure put on it from a ecological perspective, this has isolated the area allowing for creatures to grow much larger. We see this on islands now with smaller species. If kept away from other animals like predators, they will tend to grow larger in isolation due to the limited resources, predation, and competition. So due to this isolation in frigid temperatures, Simon would be correct in assuming that maybe this was some long dead animal species that adapted to this area in isolation and as a result grew to tremendous sizes as the colony is now attacking the ship. But again, because I already spilled the spaghetti out of my pocket earlier telling you what this creature was, we know that it is something different. However, taking a look at its morphology real quick, we can see these creatures are most definitely tentacles or excuse me, arms of some kind. I use arms and tentacles interchangeably but their bodies are covered with spiked protrusions and there does not appear to be any internal skeleton in them, meaning they can twist and contort to however is necessary. On the end of these tentacles, they then open up into mandibles with internal teeth being seen. These mandibles are there to hold onto prey, wrapping around them and pulling them into the mouth of the arm. From here, these operate likely much like how a snake's digestive system works. The protracted digestive system exists as the creature is then held in the arm, moved through and digested, removing all muscle, fat, and epithelial tissue until it is nothing but bone. This implies that there may be multiple digestive systems, one per arm, and later we will see how this works in conjunction with the actual creature's main body mass. Devising a plan to get off the ship, they get into the dinghy and they begin making their way through as the power is finally cut out on the ship. Walking in darkness, it says nothing but flammable pipes and tentacle monsters from here on out, boys. They then ask Simon which way they should go as they realize they're going to have to go into the murky sewage water to get around. Entering a nice green water that apparently is no longer that dark and murky for some reason, I always hold my breath to see if I would survive and the answer is no, I would die. As they swim, Mulligan gets clever girl as an arm comes to greet him, which honestly was any movie in the 90s untouched by Jurassic Park, not likely. So everyone in the back starts panicking now as tentacles have found them. They shut the door, but this only works for a little bit. Simon jumps in and nopes out of there as everyone else stands their ground. Bad idea though, as the door then gets blasted off of its hinges as Trillian falls backwards and Joey jumps in leaving Mason who jumps in last. Though he took too long and then gets grabbed and dragged back detonating a concussive force detonator in the process. As Joey emerges, they realize Mason ain't coming back. They lock themselves in the kitchen as they try to figure out what their next move is. Mulligan says they need to stay right there, and Finnegan says, well, I'm not going to stay here, as Team Lead then pulls a force multiplier on Mulligan during his freakout as it turns into another standoff. Seriously, where'd you hire these guys? Finnegan then tells a story about how a baby octopus was able to get the cork off a bottle and eat the fish inside. This convinces Mulligan that they need to get out of there before the tentacles find them, but as he stands there, nobody does anything except starts freaking out as the tentacle is right behind him. He then turns over basically his entire thousand round force multiplier and just straight lights the thing up forcing it back up the ventilation pipe he survives his encounter but does the smart thing and just stands there mocking it as then another shows up and eats him nice so with what's left of the squad they start getting sectioned off by the creature it's learning and closing the hatches the arms are pushing them towards the bow of the ship which is always a good sign moving into said bow of the ship well there are all the passengers already eaten and excreted they now realize though that they lost simon and can hear the arms moving around them as the hole is finally broken through, as I have to ask, 
Like, it had already been there because the skeletons are there. Why did it have to break through? But this kicks off an escape attempt. Making a run for it, the ship begins filling with water as Simon slowly walks away and then casually jaunts after they find him. The water moves in as Joey and Team Lead get separated from Trillian and Finnegan. Team Lead goes to blow like this whole thing as Joey throws the concussive force detonator without arming it. Like, bro, you gotta calm down, man. But as it blows, it takes out the tentacles as Finnegan and Trillian try to run into a hallway, but realize I don't have the backpack, so all the engine parts are gone. Double nice. As Joey and TL run, he then pops Joey in the leg so that he can escape. No, not the comic relief. But Joey is able to crawl into a maintenance hatch before getting got, however. Back out on the deck, Simon emerges as he realizes the boat is going to sink. He then spots an island in the distance as Trillian and Finnegan see the same thing. They then lower the lifeboat cabling towards Finnegan's boat. Meanwhile, Joey hasn't bled out yet. Good on him. I guess a pop little artery didn't take a hit. He then emerges in the atrium as he finds a handheld, but then gets grabbed by Team Lead. Looking at him, well, he's getting half eaten. He then hands him the pistol to take himself out as instead he fires a shot at Joey but misses. When he goes to use it a second time, it's empty. Nice going there, bro. He is then succinctly eaten. Down on the dinghy, apparently the ship was sunk way more than imagined because it's now at dinghy level, with the door that they had to climb into last time being basically right at the waterline. Nightmare fuel. As Trillian goes in to find a key, Finnegan checks the torpedoes. Joey makes his way onto the dinghy as Finnegan is forced to tell him he lost the parts. Joey then asks about Layla, about how, you know, is she donezo? And Joey's basically told, yeah, sorry about your girlfriend, bro. Joey handles it pretty well, though, to be honest. Attaching the torpedo to the front of the hull's hull, he creates a launch point that should double back. Firing up the dinghy, they barely have enough for, like, five minutes of gas and movement-wise, but they get the engine turned over as Trillian breaks into the key locker for the sea dudes. Now, oh, great, Simon is here. As Simon approaches, all he had was, like, a flare gun. <laughs> Finnegan heads in to help her. Uh, it's like, just give Simon a swirly or something. He's just a big nerd. So as Finnegan walks through, Trillian gets caught by Simon as Finnegan misses every single shot. But oh, apparently he wasn't trying to take him out. Just run him off. Sure thing, bro. That was totally on purpose, not a result of bad aiming. So at this point, the jig is up, the news is out. The giant octopus has found them. Breaking into the atrium, this thing is going absolutely goblin mode on the environment. Emerging, Anya, it's a giant octolus. As they go to leave, Finnegan gets immediately grabbed, but not eaten like everybody else. Luckily, Finnegan was also packing the sawed-off heat. Also, Octolus just straight punches him with an arm. Like, straight across the jaw. I have no idea- well, actually, I do know what that was about. We'll talk about that in a second. But it roars at him, which seems to be an odd trait for an undersea creature to have as it continues to look at him. He pulls out the sawed-off and then takes out its eyeball. It drops him as they make a run for it. So now that we have actually seen this thing, we can finally talk about the neurology because octopus are actually quite complex, more complex than you might imagine. So as we all know, the arms of an octopus are quite insane concerning their ability to move and figure out puzzles. And that is correct, it's not just the central brain figuring things out. With an octopus, you have the central body, which is the main controlling brain. The generalized goals and intelligence come from the body of the octopus, but it should be known that the arms themselves have essentially what are many brains. These mini brains take in sensory information and actually drive the arms to move independently of the central brain. It's actually rather fascinating as it could in some ways shed light on human anatomy and neurological functioning. It's one of the more interesting stories that I've come across, but basically it's about a man who severed his spine, I believe just above his lumbar area, in an accident. Upon them connecting a spinal stimulator below the broken area of the spinal cord, he was able to think about moving his foot and eventually he was able to do so. And that's the key. Being told to think about moving your foot, in theory, the brain shouldn't have been able to communicate. So where does that leave him? It seems to imply we also think with our spinal cord, which is a collection of nerves which honestly makes perfect sense. Why would all thought cease just past the brainstem? It appears as though the spinal cord is more than just a bridge conveying orders to the body. And we also see this in the spinal arc as well, or as they are known, reflexes. Like when you burn your hand, you pull your hand away before the pain is even felt. Why is that? Because as the signal travels through sensory neurons to the spinal cord, your spinal cord realizes you are being damaged. This in turn will give the order to pull away without the brain's input as it would take way too long and more damage could be incurred. The octopus arms work very similarly, but on a greater scale. The arms will feel around and work out what's happening. Multiple neurons known as nerve rings exist. One main nerve ring connects all the nerves that branch out from the brain into the body of the octopus to coordinate information coming from the arms as the nerves create a connection with an arm that is actually two arms away. 
This crisscross pattern and communication allows for collective nerves to move arms independently of the central brain. We humans actually may have a form of this, which most people will find horrifying. It's known as alien limb syndrome. Essentially, the hand will begin behaving independently to what a person wants and will they'll basically lose control. What's even more strange is the limb will engage in complex goal-oriented activities without the person wanting it to do that. Like slapping you in the face, for instance, which is kind of horrifying. But again, if you view it from the lens of your spinal cord definitely is thinking, maybe a little less horrifying. But anyhow, with Octalus, this perfectly explains its own movement except taking it up a notch. The limbs it possesses would clearly be behaving and operating on many brains, much like a normal octopus, but with a new added adaptation potentially because of the environment it exists in. The central body possesses a mouth for it to eat, with the arms also possessing a mouth. You may be asking why. Well, think about it. With a mouth that large, it would be advantageous for the main body to consume large prey at once, such as like sharks, whales, or colossal squid, or possibly even megalodons, depending on how long that creature has been alive. But the smaller prey that happens by, a larger mouth might make it difficult for that prey to be eaten properly as it slips through and disappears into the darkness. With smaller mouths on the arms, human-sized prey or even like smaller fish or hopefully an angler fish can be consumed to bolster the body and give it nutrients. You can kind of think of it like throwing a gallon of gas into your car versus filling up. It's still gas at the end of the day and it can still make your car move. By using the mouth arms to find smaller prey or even prey that just happens by, which uses way less energy, it can then get its fill by grabbing the smaller prey rather than having to go and hunt down something bigger. So another thing to note is again, octopus are incredibly intelligent. Their problem solving abilities outclass most animals apart from higher thinking primates like us. Given that this creature is so large, we can assume more neuronal tissue to the point that this octopus may have actually reached a form of sapience, being that it can now apply knowledge to experience. And I also just want to bring up that punch again. By punching Finnegan, this confirms that it is an octopus over a squid, as octopus are also known to punch fish that they find annoying, or just out of sheer frustration, or maybe even for like no reason at all. Finnegan then gets back and finds that the windshield is broken and assumes that Joey is gone. Trillian emerges from the Sea-Doo room, calling out for Finnegan, but sees no one. As she turns around, because nobody can call out for any reason, she almost ends up bodying Finnegan, who quietly got onto the ship. Meanwhile, Simon is running around like a huge dork. As he looks down, that's his only option. Jump onto the boat. It then goes into autopilot as he jumps down onto it, breaking his leg, but he thinks he's safe because he landed there. Finnegan and Trillian also had a different plan. Straight up Resident Evil 4 this thing out of there. As they come down the hallway, they are then blocked by tentacles as they turn around. So as Simon crawls his way into the boat, he realizes it's on autopilot. Continuing their escape, they then break through the elevator doors, but luckily, those close on the tentacles for some reason. Hmm. So as Simon now attempts to pilot the ship, he realizes there's no way he's going to be doing any of that, and he's heading straight for the cruise ship. Now, I don't know if he knew about the torpedo or not, or if he just thought it was just going to run into it, but it was going pretty slow. I don't know why he was freaking out. He shouldn't have known, right? But the torpedo then detonates, taking out the ship, and the two then round a turn where, legitimately, they hit a wall, and I am almost certain the stunt doubles that were doing that most definitely got thrown from the sea dew, and that looked like it actually hurt. So as the cruise ship starts exploding, see, Resident Evil 4, they manage to hit a jump and escape. The creature is then engulfed in flames and blown apart. The next morning, as they get to dry land, everyone is just super cool about letting go of past relationships. The sea dew engine is shot to crap, somehow, doesn't really tell you, but then they share a kiss. Also, it's probably shot to crap because it was a sea dew. But because that's just how things go, you're now trauma bonded together and stuck on a deserted island together. Recipe for disaster. So as Trillian looks out, she spots Joey coming in with the tide. He managed to survive his encounter. The creature had apparently broken through the windshield and then he just swam for it, almost being taken out by a surfboard. So as they look out, I have no clue what is on that island with them or if they ended up on like Kong's Island or some insanity, but something starts making its way towards them Guaranteed they got eaten, and thus concludes Deep Rising, my literal hell. But no, for real, what was on the island? Is there Deep Rising too? I should probably look into that. Except to be like, Land Rising, or I don't know, Land Horizontal, because it's coming, well, Land Descending, because it's coming from a hill. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, then leave a like would be awesome of you, and subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on when I post. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, Roanoke Tales, channel link, and merch link. Uh, speaking of Roanoke Tales, though, last week we talked about the giant in Afghanistan that ate a bunch of soldiers. So you might want to go check that out if you find that 
like type of stuff interesting, but also speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First huge thank you to our astrophysicist, Death's Dancer. Thank you, man. I'd also like to thank our scientist, Chad, the enjoyer of scientific explanations of B-grade horror movies, Dakota 23, Josh Blanchard, Lucian Dragon, Metric System, The Last Final Girl on the Left, and Trash Panda in the Trench Coat. And to the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. Your help goes a long way towards keeping this channel running and is greatly appreciated. But that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and we'll see y'all in the next one.